Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming to session DA202. Who went to chain smokers last night? All right, one, two, all right. How's your hearing? Should I speak louder? <laughs> all right, so we have two sessions today. Uh, I know you, you guys have a choice of multiple sessions, so as a gift, we have two sessions today. One by me, I'm Parviz Dehim. I'm a big, dis, big data specialist at Google. And with me, I have Robin, Senior Director of Data Engineering, Data Science from Tapjoy. A uh, bit of introduction on what I do. At Google, I'm fortunate enough to work with a variety of different customers. And it's an exciting job. I get to work with so many different use cases, so many different customers, and see what they do and how they do stuff. And uh, it's not a single day that I'm not surprised on what customers do and what customers don't do and how impressive the stuff that they do with the stuff and with the tools that we give them. And Robin is here to tell you about the journey that he took from uh, Vertic on-prem, uh, Hadoop on-prem, moving it to BigQuery, moving the data and analytics to uh, Hadoop running on Google uh, uh, Compute Engine and a few other resources that he's using today. Uh, so all of our customers take an exciting journey to get there. And as I was uh, writing this uh, presentation, it went back. I went back to the journey that I took back in 2011, and that's when I started working with a variety of different tools and uh, big data products. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember Hadoop 0.2, Spark 0.3. That's back then when Spark was running on Mesos, didn't have its own scheduler. Remember the days I used to work with Matei to get stuff uh, troubleshooted. And then Spark came along to start taking over Hadoop. Kafka came along, and a few other different tools came along. And the reason they all came along was to satisfy one goal that all of our customers have been asking, and they're asking today, which is reduce time to insight. Customers want to get really fast insight from da their data, and they want to get it now. It's not, no longer acceptable to wait for the batch of data to be processed, wait for a day, wait for, for a week even. So th that's not acceptable anymore. And I'm s we're starting to see the paradigm of people moving from batch to streaming. And it's, it's been interesting, actually. Some people are still streaming batch. Some people are still doing some uh, part of it doing streaming. And what I found out working with customers is that simply moving to streaming analytics doesn't make your infrastructure quicker doesn't give you ability to get insight from your data quicker. What customers have to do, and what I found out from working with a variety of different customers, is that they have to simplify, they have to sanitize, and they have to optimize their infrastructure. And that's what I'm going to talk to you guys about today. It's a very quick talk from me, 10 minutes, and I'll do my pitch. And Robin's going to come and talk about their journey. Hopefully, this is clear enough for you guys to see from here. But this is typically, if I have to summarize all the architecture that I see from my customers, everyone that I talk to, this is a general summarization of what customers do. And I'm using Google products here because I love the Google products and it's a Google conference. But you can replace these components with open source solutions. For example, uh, sorry. So pops up. Uh, you can replace that with Kafka or Apache Kafka or, or any other sort of ingest tool. Uh, Dataflow, Spark, Flink, they're all open source solutions. Uh, BigQuery, data warehousing solution, and you can replace that with anything else that you like. But the general theme is that customers use some sort of real-time data ingest tool, like PubSub or Kafka. They use some sort of distributed system to take that data and put it into some sort of data warehouse, some other NoSQL databases, or something else. What happens is that this is sort of a good architecture, but it's semi-optimized. And I don't know if you guys, actually, it's obvious what's not optimized here. You go from streaming, you're doing streaming now, but towards the end, to start doing some sort of cleaning, aggregation, joining, and doing discovery of data. All this stuff in red takes time, takes time. It takes a day. Like, they wait for a day to aggregate. They wait for a day to join data. Joining data takes a long time. So from that perspective, this is not a really streaming architecture. This is streaming at ingest, but, all, but still baffling in a batch paradigm. So throughout this talk, I'm just going to unpack that, talk about a few things that you guys, customers, should be able to do, 
very high level, but hopefully it's helpful to you guys. One of the first things I want to talk about is simplify your architecture. As much as you can, use simple tools and simple, uh, simple platforms. It's tempting, and it's very valid to use Spark, Dataflow, Apache Beam, uh, Flink, all the different distributed systems. But it's common that I talk to customers where all they do is they take data and do some cleaning. They do some sanitization. And if that's all what you're doing, you don't need to use a distributed system. It's OK to use it, but with distributed system, you have to maintain it. You have to make sure it's updated. You have to make sure the bugs are fixed. You have to deal with semantics of exactly once delivered, at least once delivered. There's a lot of complicated stuff that you have to deal with. But if all you're doing is simple tasks, it would be easy to use something like Cloud Functions that is event-driven architecture. Data comes in, event gets fired to Cloud Functions. You do something with it and gets put that data in destination, in, in the sink, or wherever it needs to go. It's simple. It's serverless. You don't have to manage an infrastructure. You don't have to patch anything. You don't have to do DevOps or anything else. It's already taken care of for you. So very simple. Use simple point of solutions, something like Cloud Functions or other things. Sanitize your data early. Generally, or very common, what I see is customers do cleaning of data when data gets to destination. That's fine, and it's much better than many other architecture I've seen. But if what you're doing is cleaning, try to do cleaning at ingest time. Try to do cleaning of data at the cloud functions. If you're using Spark Streaming at Spark, Flink, Apache uh, Beam, Dataflow, whatever. Do that cleaning early on in the process. Most customers actually try to do this, and they're doing this. So I think this point uh, should be simple to do. The other thing is schema validation. What customers do is they put data in destination, and they do discovery to find data. But what I like my customers to do is they do schema validation and schema registration much earlier in the process. Because what happens is that customers put data in the destination. In this case, BigQuery actually does the schema validation for you. So you're in a good spot if you're using BigQuery. But if your destination or your sync does not do schema validation, make sure that you do that early on in the stage of the process. It helps you with cleaning of data. It helps you with the discovery of data. It helps you with the documentation, what's actually in the data. Oh, join. I would say 8 out of 10 of slowness of any distributed data system that I've worked with with customers comes from joining data sets. Joining data sets that are big, joining data sets that are skewed, and joining data sets that don't need to be joined at the destination. So what I've found out and what customers, some of my customers do, and I'm, I'd love for you guys to do, is when you, if you think you need to join common data sets at the destination, at the sync, do that joining during the ingest time. For example, convert your joins to lookups. In this case, I'm using Bigtable as a NoSQL database to do a lookup of data as data comes in and nest that data before data gets into BigQuery. So now I don't have to do joining at the destination level. It's not applicable to every use case. I'm not saying you can completely get rid of join at destination. But if you can at least 30, 40, 50% of your workloads using nested data set, you see an extremely amount of good optimization in your queries and, and whatever you're doing at the destination. So again, uh, the pattern here is to convert your joins to nesting. Another thing is pre-aggregation. Another thing that customers do often is do aggregation at the uh, destination level. So they let data go in, they write group buys, and they do some sort of uh, uh, aggregation. If you can, very similar to nesting of data, as data comes in from your, from your ingest point, try to do pre-aggregation before data goes in. I've seen a blog, some, uh, one of the uh, customers, what they were doing is taking the data and as data comes in, they keep a counter in the NoSQL database. And they use that counter to do pre-aggregation of data. So for example, if they're doing aggregation on a daily basis, and let's just say number of users per day, instead of waiting for that data to get to the destination and write a group by, join, uh, group by query on top of that data sets, what they do is they say, here's a simple lookup table in Bigtable. This is my day. And here's the number of counts for that element in a given day. And what they do is they, join, they put that data in Bigtable. And interesting thing is BigQuery gives you ability to query Bigtable without moving data. 
So now you have the ability to join data outside of your destination. Data is already joined. Now you can write a query that reads from Bigtable directly without actually applying any group by. It simplifies your architecture, simplifies your query, and it actually optimizes and gives you much better performance. By far, something that customers are not doing today, and I love to see them do, is create a feedback loop. A feedback loop is for you guys to look at to see what your system is doing and keep improving it as you see more workloads. And this is one of the best practices of building a uh, system, like a, a complex system. Complex systems always have sort of feedback loop. So as you're building your infrastructure, as you're building your analytical infrastructure, use some sort of audit logs. For example, BigQuery gives you an audit log as an extremely rich set of data set that tells you what BigQuery has done, what queries has been written, how much bytes scanned, what the cost of that query was. So use that feedback loop for using the audit logs to understand what queries have you run for the last couple of weeks. Is it mostly group by? Is it join? Do you have a ton of joins happening? And run that report on a weekly basis. And once you find these like, repeated group buys and joins, take them apart and see if you can implement that early on in the stage of a streaming. Like, for example, cloud functions. Like I mentioned, bring nesting into the picture. Bring uh, pre-aggregation at the uh, ingest time into the picture. And run this report every week just to make sure you're optimizing your infrastructure. And hopefully, towards the end, this is the picture you're going to have, where data comes in from ingest point. You're doing pre-aggregation. You're doing joins. Uh, I'm sorry, you're doing nesting instead of doing join at the ingest points. Clean data will go to BigQuery or any destination you guys have. And you are writing a federated queries over Bigtable where data is already uh, join, uh, aggregated. And now you have this end-to-end -end with a much lower latency, which much reduced latency and reduced time to your insight. That was me. I, as I promised, quick. Hopefully, that makes sense. Next, I'm going to bring Robin to the stage. Before he speaks, I'm going to say one fun fact about Robin. <laughs> I was having dinner with Robin, and I found out not only he's a dir director of data engineering, dir director of data science on Tapjoy, he's a multi-marathon runner, Boston marathon runner, ultra marathon runner. And I don't know if you guys know what ultra marathon runner is. That's running two marathons in the same day, 52, uh, 52 miles. He's not a normal human being. So next, <laughs> Robin on the stage. All right, thank you, everyone. Uh, Robin Lee, Director of uh, Data Engineer and uh, Data Science Engineer here at Tapjoy. So jumping quickly into our agenda, very quickly, we're going to talk about two pieces. First one, uh, we're going to talk about MPP Solution, one of the rock star product from Google. And then the second part, we're going to talk about our journey switching from our on-premises data center into GCE. Specifically, we're going to touch piece. Uh, we're going to touch point on how do you, how do we actually run Elastic MyProduce workload and Spark workload using GCE. So um, there are going to be a lot of materials in my session. So I put a lot of the details, like configuration logic details, in my slides. I might not necessarily to cover all of them, especially on the second part. Just make sure you get the slides later on if you want to refer back to the logic and configurations. So. All right, let's move on. All right, so uh, very quickly, who we are, who is TechJoy, what do we do? So, in short, TechJoy is an advertising network. We're sitting in between, you know, advertisers and partners. We have our SDK integrated pretty much into all the top apps within Android and iOS store, and also we're buying our supplies and demand from open exchanges. So, you know, in another word. We all the, you know, all the annoying videos, banners, and messaging pop-ups you have when you're using an app, the chance is pretty much is actually from us. You know? But you know, we try to deliver the right advertisement to the right people at the right moment. Um, and because we have our own SDKs, we have all the user interaction signals. When you, when you, when you interact with an app and when you're interacting with an advertisement. So, uh, putting all of these into some perspective, uh, our daily data addition is about 25 terabytes, and it is compressed. If you decompress it, it's about 100 terabytes per day. So um, our team is very, very vertical. Starting from the right-hand side, we build our own infrastructure, you know, uh, including provisioning servers, bring the data in, clean them up, make sense of them, training the modules, uh, you know, and serve them out to, for real-time 
uh, advertisement predictions at about 500,000 to 700,000 RPM with a latency less than 20 milliseconds. So as you can imagine, our technical stack is very deep. And the part we're going to talk about today is one, MPP, and two, Spark. This is the whole architecture of our current data science stack. But I just want to put the point which I'm going to attach today onto the map so you guys have a reference. OK, let's uh, start from Big Korea. In 2014, right, you know, we were facing increasingly challenge of how do we scale up our existing MPP system with very limited resources, and more ambitiously, how are we going to do it cheaper? I mean, not only per query cheaper, but also as a total cost cheaper. So those are the comp configurations. Oops, sorry. Uh, very standard ones, uh, you know, those are the functions we supported bef before the migration. Um, data warehousing, you know, EDLs, and we, highly, we, we aggregate them in, uh, using highly aggregated uh, data marts into star, uh, star schema and the slow, snowflake, uh, snowflake schema functions, and supporting all of the reporting system, supporting all the anal analytic ad hoc uh, uh, operations, and we support all the data feature explorations, et cetera. So as you, as you can imagine, right, those put a lot of challenges on our small team. So storage compute, right, tightly coupled together on Vertica. You know, one doesn't really scale with the other one. And we also, we also have all of these technical burdens on DB, DBA, I mean tasks, and DevOps tasks. And adding on top of that, the cost is another burden factor, including the licensing cost, support cost, plus you know, uh, the cost running our, our hardware by ourselves. So that's why, you know, when BigQuery coming into the picture is quite a revolutionary solution for us. And to be honest, all of these challenges are not very specific to Vertica at that time. It's particular, it's, I think it's very, very common issue that everybody's facing back to four or five years ago. So let's take a look, take a look at a BigQuery, right? When you get into BigQuery, right, all the storage compute are virtually unlimited. If you want to scale up, the issue is pretty much just Google's problem now. And you know, in, in BigQuery, there's no more this projections, that projections. BigQuery doesn't require an user to put a projections or indexes on your table in order to perform. And no mention, there is no hardware dependencies. You don't really uh, need to worry about DevOps or DVM in tasks. And you know, the cost is just going to be cheaper. I'm, I'm going to touch that specific point in the later slides. So um, our migration considerations, again, very standard ones, right? We project our cost. We benchmark our workload. The diagram you see on the right-hand side was from, two, uh, from three, four years ago, where all the top 15 production queries we were benchmarking at then. This is a stacked bar chart. The right one shows how long it takes to run it on Vertica. The blue chart shows how long it runs uh, in BigQuery. Uh, just a disclaimer, this is uh, back to three years ago. These days, I'm sure BigQuery will run much, much faster. The only thing I want to highlight on this particular slide is remap, remap your data modules and how do you translate your query into BigQuery syntax. The reason I want to highlight these two parts is back to three years ago, BigQuery wasn't supporting the standard SQL syntax. And it, doesn't re it didn't really support the uh, partition table, i.e. the logical partitions. So that's why we spend a lot of time. I'm sure if we want to go through the same journey again these days, we don't need to put the same amount of resources and time on these two parts. So jumping straight into outcomes, scales and cost. We are able to twice uh, scale our uh, data storage just within one year after we migrated to BigQuery. And we are able to bring the cost down to 30%. And interestingly, interestingly that factor still holds these days. Right? Putting, putting into some context, the hardware cost that, that we, we pay when we run out Vertica still exists, exceed the total amount that we run on, on our total workload uh, in BigQuery these days. And all the technical benefits we got, such as you know, you got this uh, high availability automatically available to you, and all these 
disaster recovery capability. The last piece is actually coming to us out of a surprise, which means we actually see a lot of less data friction when we, when end users trying to utilizing our data and using data to drive their day-to-day -day decisions. Let me give you some examples. So we're starting to see increasingly number of uh, account managers, salespeople, product managers starting to use BigQuery these days. I think that's only because, one, using BigQuery is just as, as using a you know, Gmail inter web interface, right? You don't really uh, require the user to install a uh, SQL driver or a SQL analyzer by starting to using that. And secondly, sharing data in BigQuery is very simple. All the queries can be saved down to a link and shared. And also, you can also run that query, save it down to a data set and set, share with your counterparts. So all of these combines together, we see increasingly data adoptions within our organizations. So the next few slides, though, I'm going to try to touch some of the good practices or our practices when, we, when it comes to using BigQuery, right? And hopefully, it'll help you guys. So first of all, partitioning tables. Um, if you are on the Lexi SQL in BigQuery, very intuitively, you want to, per you want to merge the less frequently used small partitions into, big into bigger ones. And if you are already on the st standard SQL these days, w what we actually recommend you to do is you actually don't expose the raw data to an user because that's actually a right, uh, one large piece of logical partitions, right? And instead, you can define the layer of views for user access and using something called authorized views to give different users different access to different portion of your partitions. All right, moving on, uh, we absolutely encourage people to starting to versioning their schemas and standardize their schema controls. In our practice, for example, we don't allow end user to change any of the schema definitions within core production schemas. And instead, if user wanted to add a, add a column or change a column, we ask them to put in a pull request, check in all of their schemas as a JSON file, and there are going to be like automatic deployment process to alter the table after the pull request has been reviewed and approved. Specifically, we want we encourage our users to put a description field right over there, right, in the schema file. So later on, when those schema are adapting BigQuery, you can actually see the description on the preview feature. This, that's actually a pretty neat feature in BigQuery. You can actually preview the data and preview all the uh, schema definitions along with the description field to, to e further encourage uh, making sense of data and data adoptions. So, you know, uh, the next one is about cost control. I've been asked a lot of questions. How do you guys actually do cost control in BigQuery? Because BigQuery charge you about on the amount of data moved per query, right? The way how we do it is by putting quota not onto the main production scheme uh, projects, but on different other projects that different user group belongs to. For example, our core production projects sitting in the middle, we have different satellite projects around it. And each different people, uh, each different user group belongs to the satellite group. We have quotas set up on, on those projects, but all of these users can still access to the production pro uh, projects. In that way, they can use their own quota with, from their own projects, but still ha have been able to run queries or workload against the production schemas. The last one, right, in BigQuery section is. The hyperlog log function, right? It stands for, uh, well, it, it is a function used for cardinality estimation. We use it a lot. We're absolutely loving it. And for example, you can just uh, estimate your cardinalities for each segment and put it into a sketches. If you want to estimate the cardinalities across all of these segments, you can merge them together. When it comes to Google's version of hyperlog log, they actually improve it in terms of proficient, uh, precision and, proficient, uh, and efficiency. They call it hyperlog log plus, right? So I'm going to take a moment and pause for a little bit. Do we have any Google BigQuery PM sitting in the audience today? No? All right, I'm still going to ask that question. How about expose that hyperlog log function from Google 
via a API or a standardized library. So we can actually produce those sketches outside of BigQuery. For my use cases, it's like I want to start to produce cardinality as soon as the user comes in in my streaming process, and I want to um, dump them later on into BigQuery. Right now, where I'm not able to do that. Right? So that's something I want to ask Google's PM to think about. So the next section, right? Um, to, you know, two years after we adopting BigQuery, our on-premises data center um, that we built for Hadoop and Spark coming into the life end of life cycle. So basically, people are facing two options. One is to attack refresh, refresh all of these hardwares and continue running colo, and then, or you can, you know, going back to your um, pla uh, cloud platform. So we were more linked towards the later one. Although we have a lot of uh, fun building our own on-premises data center, but uh, you know, there's a lot of technical burdens. You know, given the maturity of the cloud system, you know, it, I think it just makes more sense for the company our sizes to lean more towards on the, from the cost efficiency point of view. So this is a brief history of how our data science uh, computational infrastructure evolution path. So when I got here in 2011, we only had five nodes of Hadoop. We put it into AWS. It was insanely expensive. You cannot believe how expensive it is back to seven years ago if you want to run five node tiny cluster in the cloud. So the next year, we decide, OK, so we want to run our own metal, uh, bare metal. Uh, we use a company called Software later on being acquired by IBM. And then in 2014, we decide that's it. We want to put a X million dollars by our own hardware and put it into a data center. We actually put it a few blocks away from our, uh, from the, actually the AWS US East One data center, a few blocks away. We tunnel them through a f uh, with a direction fiber link. And then we outsource all of our you know, data center operations to Equinix. We use level three as the network. You know, we, uh, we hire MetaCloud to do the virtualization layer for us. We do all of these outsources, but we still got all of these technical burdens, like turnaround time of the smart hands in a cage trying to re swap, uh, swap a node, et cetera, et cetera. So in 2017, we decided to try Google Cloud. And those are the considerations, again, Scales and cost and technicals are very straightforward and intuitive, right? So there's no upfront, cap, uh, upfront capital anymore. There's no, you don't need to worry about hardware depreciation, depreciation cost. And the piece that made us to lean more towards Google is actually our data strategy, right? Um, we have running in AWS for our service layer for a long time. But I think it's time for us to look at a different vendor to prevent one single vendor uh, lockdown. And plus, we have been running in BigQuery at that time for already two, over two years. Um, we think it just makes sense for us to put our Hadoop and Spark technology to closer to our, uh, BigQuery, uh, to our BigQuery piece. And the last piece is uh, we were running a lot of machine learning module at that time. And we think it's the time for us to start utilizing some of the TPU power that provided by Google Cloud ML. All right. So what specifically, why do we run Elastic, MyProduce, and Spark using GCP? not other cloud vendors. There are basically two ports, right? First of all, if you want to run an Elastic, uh, MacReduce, and Spark cluster, one essential point is you, the cloud is, should be able to provision the VMs fast enough, right, to minimize the overhead of uh, scale, down and scale, uh, scale up and scaling down. So you know, Google always has been known as the uh, new kids around the block, so a lot of the APIs they, ha they can design from the ground up. It's actually very efficient when it comes to the VM launching time. The other reason is the pricing, right? If you want to run a good, stable, spot fleet in AWS, you, can, you should have at least bid around 30% on their uh, asking price. You know, but if you want to do the same preemptible instances in Google, they just give you 80% straight away. So, um, that's something we consider as a pricing advantages over other piece. So how about this specific elastic usage, right? So this is a, a CPU utilization chart. I put it out from 
about 24 hours a day. And uh, if we zoom it in, you can actually see th um, between different times, are, we're just utilizing different level of CPU usages. And the framework itself is about detecting what's the resources that's needed in the queue and trying to scale up and scaling down accordingly. So you guys probably want to argue there are just a lot of different vendors on the market trying to do the same thing, right? There are data breaks, there is uh, AWS EMR, and there is uh, you know, Google, uh, Kubel, right? All trying to do the same thing. Why do we have to try to do it by ourselves as an in-house solution? So the reason is um, we are looking some of the specific features that's no, not available from one single vendors. For example, we want the cluster to be able to run both Hadoop and Spark within the same cluster. We want it to be able to do zone uh, balancing and seeking the best pricing within each of the zone and capacity with each, uh, within the, each of the zone. And also, we want to run heterogeneous clusters, different, different node sizes, different node types, and, other, uh, and there are just other benefits. We try to do some customizations. All of these functionalities that we require doesn't really come from one single vendor at that time. So that's why we, def we decide to build it by ourselves. And you know, more importantly, you know, how hard it can it be? Turns out it's actually not very hard. Uh, it actually takes our uh, one developer three months to pull all of these pieces together. So technically, it's totally doable. Um, but you know, if you want to run it in an actual cloud production environment, the tuning and configurations actually takes longer time. So first thing what we did is to separate the compute and storage. That means our Hadoop and Spark cluster doesn't really persist any permanent data on the native HDFS within the cluster itself. Instead, we persist our permanent data on the cloud storage. That doesn't really mean you cannot store any data on your local hard drive. You can still st uh, store temporary data and provision the local hard drive for your Hadoop and Spark cluster. Right? The next piece will be the, the MapReduce and Spark cluster themselves doing all the hard work. We're using Yarn as our resource management layer, and we use Ambari as the open source uh, cluster management tool. The last piece in there is the, just a general cloud API that provided Google for spin up a VM and shut down VM. So the problem is, you know, that piece and this piece, traditionally, they don't talk to each other. So all the framework is trying to resolve is talking to all of these different pieces and making sure they work in the right order. So let's look into different pieces. Uh, one by one. I already talked about cloud storage, uh, cloud storage piece. You absolutely need to separate your storage and compute in order for them uh, to, uh, to scale accordingly. And there are just two ways to structure your Hadoop and Spark cluster. Uh, one way is you can have your uh, per cluster per job, which means whenever you spun up a job, you spun up a process, you can spun up a cluster. And as soon as the job finishes, you shut down that cluster. Um, this is actually a very clean, uh, easy way of doing this, but um, we actually see a lot of uh, overspending and overprovision happens around there. For example, one of my data scientists just spun, uh, requires a 100 node Hadoop cluster and, and leave it in there for like 10 hours. Nobody knows. So, another word, don't trust your user, right? So, <laughs> the way how we provision our cluster is we have a finite number of clusters. And within each cluster, we structure it into two layers. One is what we call the persistent node, which is the node that runs 2007, which runs you know, the, master, uh, the name node, the resource managers, and zookeeper, et cetera, et cetera, those kind of like controlling functions. And we also have 223, what we call the base slave node. The reason we have a, uh, the slave, uh, base slave node in there to run 24-7 is basically because um, a lot of the small jobs in our system come and goes really frequently. You, you absolutely want to avoid that VM launching overhead. And plus, certain MapReduce jobs requires to persist a application binary within the cluster themselves. So those nodes are for those purposes as well. Um, the rest of the layer will be just the Amphoro layer, where we're using spot or preemptible instances so they can scale up and down automatic, automatically. 
Uh, the yarn piece, there's really just nothing too much to talk about it. You can, um, you can use muscles if you want to. It doesn't really make a hell of a differences. But the only thing I want to point out is you know, this pending resources section, when you query the Yarn GMX matrix, this is the cluster-wide uh, average. Remember I said our cluster requires heterogeneous clusters to run different node sizes, different node, type, different node types, which means we can support different size of containers. So that means when we run this, we're going to be, uh, be a little bit clever when it comes to how much resources is pending in the queue, because this is actually a cluster average, not per application or process average. So moving on into the next two parts are really simple, right? Ambari open source cluster management layer defines what components install on the cluster. Within each of the components, what are the configurations are. This is actually an op optional piece. Uh, I'm not sure if we have any uh, Honorworks people sitting here, but if your workload is simple, if your cluster component-wise is simple, you can ignore this piece. But this is a good tool open sourced from Honorworks uh, in, our cases, in our cases, we just grab it and use it in our framework. The next one is Cloud API. There's just not really too much to talk about it. Um, but one thing I want to point out is you know, um, try to abstract your calls to the, v, to the VM layer. Right? Um, let's say if, uh, if I want to support multi-cloud um, operations in my clusters, right? Google people may not like this, but let's say if I want to support both AWS and Google within my framework, or I wanna, when, I, when my framework wants to spun up a VM, the underlying layer needs to be abstracted to, to know how to spun up a VM in Google as well as how to spun up a VM in AWS. So the next one is just a quick example of what they call blueprint definition from Ambari, which gives you the definitions uh, in a JSON format for house group components definition, auto configurations, and hosting classifications. And at the runtime, Ambari can get, just grab all of these configura configurations and, and construct a cluster by themselves. So um, when a resource request coming into the queue, those are the life cycles. Very intuitive. You know, when there's a request, we check whether a resource is available, and then we run a job. After the job is done, we shut down the node. Very intuitive. What's the hard part on this diagram? The hard part is actually this piece. Right? When do you try to release a node? That comes to two parts. One is, you know, how do you actively detect which node is idle? And the second one is, how do you deal with sudden termination of your node? Let's say if in the middle of a job, one of my underlying nodes just get, got kicked out from the cloud, uh, cloud themselves because of uh, you know, supply constraints on the preemptible instances. So I'm going to touch those two pieces in the later on slides. This is the uh, fr framework general structure. Right? Uh, I'm not going to go into too much of the details. You can always refer back to the slides. The only thing that I want to cut out is this particular piece. When you run a heterogeneous cluster of different node sizes, different node types, different node types, you absolutely want to normalize each of these node types and resources into a single unit so you can do cross-the-board comparison. Right? In our, for example, if you have a R4 X large instances, and if you or if and if you have M4 X large instances, when it comes to re computational resource and and job resources, how do you compare these two together? Right. In our cases, we normalize into one single base unit. The R4 equivalent to 1.5 SCUs, the M4 equivalent to you know 1.2 SCUs. So we actually borrow this concept from Databricks. The way how they use this normalization is to charge pricing for their customer. But what we think is, you know, that's a cool concept. We can use it to compare resources requirements as well. And um, those are the actual logic when it comes to the resource calculations. Uh, unfortunately, TypeJoy is not a, an open source company. So I'm not actually able to show all of our actual code here, but I use pseudocode to describe the logic. Um, you also probably notice I strapped out a price bidding part. This is solely for AWS. As for Google, you don't really need to do that. They just give you 80% discount straight away. 
the only reason we want to do this in AWS is because uh, we train our own module to look at a histogram of, a spi uh, of the price, of, as well as all the spikes on the pricing. So try to predict uh, all the pricing at a given future for a, a particular instant type for a given zone. All right, but that case doesn't really apply to the GCE part. So the next few slides, right, is about how do you tone your cluster on the cloud environment. There are a lot of configurations and considerations that we learned from our running our uh, Elastic MyProduce um, on the cloud. But I'm not going to go through into the details. The only thing I want to cut out is this specific piece on the top. How do we identify idle resources within your cluster? Right. So when you run, when you, it's actually working different ways in Spark and Hadoop. In Spark, executor doesn't really exit until all the jobs, uh, until this job finishes. So it's actually very clean and neat. You can shut down a uh, cluster resources, you know, if this, uh, the Spark, a particular Spark job is finished. However, when it comes to MapReduce, a re release on the computational resource on uh, Hadoop doesn't really, re really mean the re release of the entire resources for that MapReduce job. For example, if you have a mapper produce some intermediate output and store on a local hard drive, although the job finish, uh, sorry, although the mapper finishes, it releases the computational resource, it doesn't release the local temporary data that generate generated, which is going to be utilizing in the later on stage after shuffling in the reducing stages. So if you chop down that node at this particular moment, your reducer will have to go asking the mapper again. That mapper is going to spin up once again to reproduce those data. So you've got to be careful, not only checking the, the computational resource released from a MapReduce job, but also check whether the data are also released from that particular node. All right, so for the last few minutes, I absolutely want to touch the point how to manage instance lifecycle on a preemptible instances fleet within GCP, right? So this is a, about two weeks of data I took by the, from the end of 2017. Um, each of the bars here shows you how long each preemptive instances runs before the cloud kicks them out. So we're not trying to proactively kick them out. We simply launch the instances, have them sitting in there, and try to see how long they, it goes. Right? The scale is a little bit difficult to see, but the right line here marks about one hour. And if we zoom in, we can actually see the life cycle of a preemptible instance within Google Cloud are very sparse. So Within your framework, not only just MapReduce or Spark or whatever, the service layer you run with on a cloud environment, if you want to utilize uh, a large amount of preemptible instances, like in our case, we run 99% of our workload on preemptible instances for Hadoop and Spark. You got to have some failover strategies right, to protect yourself, to ease the dev, uh, DevOps operations. So um, fortunately, you know, Yarn already handles three out of the four pieces for you, right? But you still need to do something for yourself. If you're on your job pipeline level, right, if you want to, let's say if you're running in Jenkins or, Air or Airflow, you know, always have a retry strategy so, so that your DevOps people don't need to go in there and rerun the job if they've ever failed because of the preemptive instance got taken away. But even if the above is not very safe as well, let's say if in our cases, by the end of the day, we try to run none of the batch to refresh our modules and refresh all the statistic, statistics we use to build up the module. All of these jobs runs really long, about three, four hours. Inevitably, all of the retry li has limits, right? So the way how we do this is, first of all, at the beginning of this batch, we washed out all the pre preemptible instances. And then we fill up the cluster with non-preemptible ones. We'll, we hold the cluster size steady. By the end of the batch, we washed out all of the non-preemptible ones, and we, we let the cluster do themselves. Uh, sorry, do do do, the own, do their own things uh, using preemptible instances. So this is actually a very clean 
and, uh, and neat way of doing this, a guarantee to work. The downsides of this, when you use the non preemptible instances, you got to pay like eight times uh, uh, more expensive than the preemptible ones. So uh, at the beginning of our adoption into GCP, this is, the right, uh, this is actually the way in production, but these days it's not. Right? These days we do a hack. Um, if you're interested, uh, how do we do that for preemptive instance? Feel free to contact me because that hack is is relies on analyzing Google's behavior of its own data. So I don't think I should be able to disclose on the public. But pin me if you have that questions in mind after the work. So I know there's a lot of again I know there's a lot of materials I went through uh, for the specific logic and configurations. Refer back to my slides if you want to. That marks the end of my session. And now we'll come Parvis back so we take questions. Thank you.